Dr. Charleston has already shared a bit about Dr. Russell Young and his work. He's an accomplished sociologist and a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University. When Dr. Zhang and his colleagues learned how COVID-19 was being publicly associated with China, they knew that it would trigger acts of hate, discrimination, and violence against people of Asian descent. And they knew that documenting those acts would be critically important to raising awareness and combating them. Part of their work is raising awareness of not just individual incidences, but of the long and terrible history of anti-Asian violence in this country that started long before this pandemic and that these incidents in turn connect to and which many in our community know little about. That is the starting point of real change. I hope all of you will leave today with new ideas, new connections, and a new sense of the role that you, we can all play in combating this and in working together towards greater justice and greater inclusivity within our community. So please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Russell Zhong. Uh, thank you, Dr. Blank, for um, the warm introductions, and um, I'm sure University of Wisconsin-Madison will miss you. I have to keep my mask on. The other, I know. I don't. I don't know what Professor McGinnis was talking about. <laughs> All right, I feel much more safe. So, thank you, uh, um, Chief Diversity Officer Lavar um, Charleston, for the invite. Thank you to. Um, Andrew Rishingani for inviting me today, for Mary Lee Carr for her hospitality. I really um, appreciate um, Asian American Studies Chair Lorraine Lopez to have Lee from the APITA Student Center. Um, you know, the Asian love language, have you guys heard of the love languages? There's five universal love languages. How many of you? Yeah, you know, it's like affirmation, touch. There's other love languages, you know, and so an Asian one is actually food. And so I really appreciate the free food out there, and I feel very loved by that. And so I hope you will feel loved and go ahead and get the food while it's free. Um, so, um, you know, we got the Time 100 Most Influential Award this year. And Thanks. Um, we had a discussion in my household. There's only three of us. And we, you know, we, we spoke about who's the most influential in our household. And I was voted number three. <laughs> and they said if we had a dog, I'd be number four. <laughs> and if we had plants, I'd be number five. That's just like... But the, um, I'm really grateful for that recognition because it's not for us as individuals, but for me, I think it's the Asian American community, the APITA community, really standing up at this moment, getting recognized for the mass movement that we've um, achieved and that will continue on. And so um, what I want to talk about today is building that mass movement, what we can learn from building that movement, and how we could um, further that movement. So, as I discuss about being the movement and the changes we've made, um, I really want to encourage um, Asian Americans and other communities of color to learn from our story and to build from our story. To, if you want to make change, if you want to make changes here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, use the same sort of steps because I think they're really helpful and powerful. If you're here as an ally, Learn from our movement, so how you could support movements that are similar in making change, how you could be um, partners with us. And again, if you want to be a university here that really values diversity, really values racial justice, then um, please pay attention and learn what our community is going through so that you could be more empathetic and concerned. You know, um, there's, a, there's a big movement against critical race theory. And to me, it seems like people really don't want to discuss race. They don't want to pay attention to our history. 
and then ignore what's happening currently. And so I think this diversity forum, this, these types of conversations helps us understand our history and helps us understand what's really happening so that we could actually make a difference. And so that's why we created Stop API Hate, because we know history repeats itself. And that's why you need to know true history. That's why you need to teach truth. And the history for Asian Americans is that whenever a pandemic came from Asia, Asians were scapegoated, Asians faced interpersonal violence, and Asians faced racist policies. And since I knew that history, and since I was concerned about what was happening with COVID-19, that's why we created Stop AAPI Hate. We um, actually first asked the state government to, to document what was happening, and they said they didn't have the capacity. So we created a website in five different languages to receive firsthand accounts of racism from Asian Americans. And um, we could talk about it later, but it's actually fortuitous that we were a community-based organization because um, the community trusted us a lot more than the government. But once we launched in last March, we were flooded, inundated by, with hundreds of incidents, and they were just horrific. And I'm still sort of stupefied at how much anger and hate has been directed towards Asians. It's um, really chilling, and it's really been painful for me. And to give you a sense of what's happening, we're going to share a couple of incidents of what we've received from Wisconsin. So these are your classmates, these are your students, these are your friends, these are your fellow religious members. And what I'd like you to do is put yourself in their shoes as you hear these stories. What would it be like if you were one of them? And afterwards, I'm going to invite you from the audience to just share out a few words of your emotional response. So what I'm asking for is empathy. Tell me how you feel if you are Asian. So I'm going to invite um, Dadao and Yi to um, read these. And please put yourself in these person's shoes. Both my girlfriend and I were shopping. And a middle-aged Caucasian lady told us to keep a six feet distance from her looking at us as if we were perpetuating a crime. She did not say anything to customers of other ethnicity when they were in close proximity to her. Men in their late teens, early 20s, hurled beer bottles and slurs at me from their vehicle while I was walking home from work. Around the start of the pandemic, my family members of Filipino descent were being stared at by a white couple taking, uh, talking amongst themselves and being avoided. My sister-in-law only caught little bits of what was said, and much of it was accusation that they were carriers of the virus simply for being of Asian descent. Um, I was performing a self-checkout and in a grocery store, when two men of color shouted at me, making a scene, and said, hey, chink, get out of my counter, bitch, one of them pointed a finger gun at me and acted as if he was firing a gun. A Caucasian man shouted out to me when I was running. He said that I was spreading the coronavirus. I had a large plastic top full of dirt dropped on top of my head and body. With a small handful of onlookers, no one person stood up, spoke up, or asked if I was okay. After I shook all of the shit up and out of my hair, I broke down in my car. I was subjected to public humiliation because I'm Asian. My daughter was told, no one cares that you're Asian, so don't stop Asian hate. Go kill yourself. I found your dog and chopped it up and ate it for you. I was picking up Chinese food and walking back to my car. A car on the street slowing down opened the window and shouted at me. They tried to mock Chinese words, then ended by, fuck you. I was alone in the parking lot. My son and I were verbally attacked by a woman at a store. I was wearing a mask and sneezed. Then the woman about the fucking Chinese spreading. Contagious disease everywhere, and that I needed to get the fuck out of the store. There were dozens of people watching, and no one said anything. I was so upset that I left the checkout line and walked out of the store 
with the woman following me and yelling. Thanks. So what are some of your responses? What do you feel when you hear this? Just shout it out, please. Appalled, Appalled embarrassed. Disgusted. Disgusted. Sad, humiliated, same old. It happens everywhere. Everywhere. Guilty as a as society. Guilty as a society. The chat is disappointing, enraging, sad. You have to turn it on. So I think you're feeling what the Asian American community um, as a whole are feeling right now. We're humiliated, we're ashamed, we're appalled, we're saddened. What makes it worse is, you know, you see so many cases where they feel so alone that others were around and no one did anything as if they condoned what was happening. What I'm arguing is that Asian Americans are now experiencing collective racial trauma. This is actually a historic time. It's akin to Japanese American incarceration. Not in that it's the same experience, but in the trauma and in the collective nature of it. It's collective because when I see a grandmother being pushed, I see my own mother. And so even though I'm experiencing it indirectly, I still feel it. It's racialized because we know it's not because people see us as individuals, but they see us as part of a group and they're attacking us. And it's traumatizing because you could see how much slurs are used, how much racial epithets are used, how oftentimes it's gang bullying, how often it's when we're alone and vulnerable. And so that's why we created the website and that's what the story I'm gonna to tell today. The racism that you see um, aren't all hate crimes, but they fall under four main categories. We at Stop API Hate have received over 9,000 incidents, but that's just a fraction of what's happening. We think that at least one out of five Asian Americans have experienced this racism. That's over four million cases of hate this past year. And they fall under four main categories. Um, so on the bottom, you could see civil rights violations make up about 11%. Those are when we're mistreated at the workplace, and that's why uh, DEI is so important, institutional DEI. We're getting denied ride shares. Online harassment is more in Wisconsin, but it makes up about 8% nationwide. That's, uh, again, a small number. We know that youth who spend a lot more time on their screens report seeing a racist post or offensive meme at least once a month. And so since they're on screens a lot, they know what people are thinking about them. They know how people feel about them. Verbal harassment and um, avoidance, deliberate shunning of Asian Americans are microaggressions. They make up the bulk. They're not hate crimes. You can't be arrested for them, but they're still horrific. And again, you heard how bad they were. One out of five Asian Americans who reports a stop API hate, we did a survey, now display signs of racial trauma. That trauma is three or more symptoms, long-term symptoms of issues like depression, anxiety, hypervigilance when you're really aware of your surroundings and avoidance of places. Those are the hallmarks of trauma. And finally, physical assault make up the last category. We're getting coughed and spat upon so much so that I read it again and again. I just created a special check off. Someone spat on me today. People ask, how do you know Asian Americans are experiencing more racism? I say, in 2019, I didn't hear stories of people spitting on their fellow human, but it's happening nationwide. And I think it's just because, because of the pandemic, people want to reinfect us, right? It's a response to the pandemic. My own wife was running on a trail. Someone just blocked her path and coughed into her face. 
And then finally, physical assault makes up 8% here. Same, Wisconsin shows similar trends. We're getting pushed and shoved. We're having bottles and rocks thrown at us. People try to run us over with their cars. The hate and the violence is so prevalent that I wasn't surprised this year that elderly were pushed and killed. I wasn't surprised, sadly, that the Atlanta shootings and the Indianapolis shootings occurred because I know how palpable the hate is. And the trends have been consistent. People bully those whom they think they can bully. So women are attacked twice as much as men. Women and children, um, children and elders are more disproportionately targeted. And it's a clear case of racial profiling. Even though people blame China for COVID-19, over half of our respondents are non-Chinese. Most of them are people who look Chinese, but they're mistaken, lumped together, and mistreated. So they're Vietnamese, Koreans, Japanese, Filipino. A Latino person in LA was punched and told to go back to China. An indigenous person in Vancouver was attacked and told to go back to China. So that's the trauma, that's the violence we're experiencing at the moment. And the question really does arise, why the surge of racism now? It's just a biological virus that doesn't discriminate. Why attack Asians in such high numbers? And there's three main factors that I'll be talking about. First of all, people were afraid of the pandemic but it's clear the political rhetoric really exacerbated the situation. And it's not just Republican, it's bipartisan. So even this year, <clears throat> there's a strong anti-China movement. Um, again, if we make China the enemy, then people see Chinese in the US as the enemy. If we China bash, we're gonna bash Asians in the US. But really, the term Chinese virus really was deadly. That term, went viral, and that hate speech that went viral led to hate violence. It gave license to hate violence. It legitimated the hate violence. The term Chinese virus did two things. It racialized a biological virus, so it became a Chinese virus. And it made Chinese people the carriers of the virus. It stigmatized the people. So that connection of the virus with Chinese, of the virus is Chinese, and Chinese people had the virus, actually became part of our implicit bias, became our understanding of the virus, our understanding of who Chinese people are. So here's another story. Actually, can you, um, you, can you read this? Sorry. To... I was standing in an aisle at when suddenly I was struck from behind. Video surveillance verified the incident in which a white male using his bent elbow striking my upper back. Subsequent verbal attack occurred which shut up the emoji, fuck you China man, go back to China, bringing that Chinese virus over here. So here in this case you could see how we're treated and the source of the, the problem is that people saw that we're the ones who brought the virus. It scapegoated us, right? It's clear that notion stuck, that Chinese were the disease carriers. Later on, media representations reinforced that nexus of the Chinese being virus and virus people being, um, and Chinese people holding the virus. This is an, actually an Instagram post of a coronavirus party at another university. Students were drinking corona beer and they were partying with pictures of Chinese people with masks on, all right? Again, reinforcing that connection. And some of the pictures had their eyes X'd out as if they had died from the coronavirus. This is how university students in America are, are partying. This is another viral post, um, the supposed source of the disease. So again, as people hear that term Chinese virus, as they see repeated media representations, that becomes part of our racial schema, how we view and receive um, input, perceptions, and how we make automatic responses to it. Right, you know about schema, it's how we, um, our brain operates to make automatic assumptions. If you see a barking dog and its teeth are bared and it's growling, you don't stop and think and process slowly. 
you automatically go into fight or flight response, right? And I think in the same way, that's what's happening to the United States, is that people have begun to make that association that the virus is Chinese, Chinese people have the virus, it gets reinforced, and it becomes part of our implicit bias. It becomes the way we see the world. When we think about the virus, we think of it being Chinese. When we think of Chinese, we think about them being disease carriers, and we go into fight or flight response. So I'm not saying that everybody is being intentionally racist towards Asians, but I am saying that people are using racial lenses to view the disease, racial lenses to view Asian people, and they are getting triggered. They're already fearful because of the pandemic. And then they go into fight or flight response when they see us. And that fight response is that they may attack us. The flight response is that they may shun us. I too have that implicit bias. You know, I'm Chinese. But when my, I had a cousin from Beijing come over and I was really concerned, right? I had that bias. Oh, she's probably too may infect me. I got the flu right afterwards, and I was really concerned, and actually everybody else was concerned. Why are you sick? Who did you meet? And so if I saw someone wearing a mask early in the pandemic when people weren't wearing a mask and they were Asian, I'd be more likely to think, oh, they may be infected. I'd be more scared of them than a non-Asian. And you have to admit to yourself, we all have these implicit biases, we all have these stereotypes, and that's triggering us. That's shaping our reactions. Does it make sense to get it? This fear of Asians leads to the third factor beyond the political rhetoric, beyond the media representations, is this long-standing stereotype of the yellow peril. And this stereotype is that Asians are perilous, we're dangerous, we're a threat to the West. We're to come from the outside, from the East, with our hordes of people, with our disease-ridden bodies, and invade. And that's a long-standing fear, this yellow peril. Also for South Asians, it's the dusky peril. And this fear has been invoked time and time again, both to legitimate racism against Asians and to justify racist policies. And so let me give you a couple of examples of how the yellow peril has been invoked through our history. Here in the 19th century, you see the diseases of malaria, smallpox, and leprosy as specters of death emanating out of San Francisco Chinatown. Because, again, Chinese were stereotyped to be disease carriers like they are today, um, Congress passed the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, right? It's this fear that we would invade, that we would steal white workers' jobs, and that we were disease-ridden as heathen, pagans who are unassumable, that's what justified that, that racist policy, the first act that actually excluded an entire ethnic group. At the same time, this stereotype, the yellow peril, led to over 200 expulsions of Asian communities along the west coast in the 19th century. These weren't just individuals. These were entire communities pogroms driven out by white mob violence. My own family, my great-great-grandfather settled in Monterey, California. They, um, my family lived there for four decades, building families, a home, a thriving business. But eventually, because of the anti-Chinese sentiment, um, the landlord finally evicted the community. When the Chinese wouldn't leave, a fire burned down the entire village, and the newspapers reported that onlookers the next day cheered and looted the village. The landlord bulldozed the community, um, you know, the buildings into the Pacific Ocean and fenced off the area so that Chinese couldn't return. My great-grandfather in immigration records was named one of the largest shippers of Monterey in the day, but he had to move to San Francisco Chinatown penniless because of that racism. It would take my family a few generations before we became homeowners again because of this mass displacement, this yellow peril fear, the explosions of Chinese. The connection between race and health policy again occurred in 1900 when the bubonic plague came. It was found in Chinatown, so health officials segregated the area. They allowed whites to leave 
but they kept Chinese quarantined there with ropes and barbed wire. They actually had armed sentries patrolling so that Chinese stayed there, presumably to get sick. In Santa Ana, California, in Honolulu, Chinatowns, the entire Chinatowns were burned down, leaving thousands homeless. That's why the Chronicle article says that the bubonic plague has eerie parallels to today. A disease comes, Asians get blamed, Asians face violence, Asians face racist policies. It continued at Angel Island Immigration Center. You guys heard about Ellis Island, right? When Europeans came, it usually took them about two to three hours to disembark, to be processed and disembarked and to be welcomed to the new land. Because Chinese were seen as illegal, because we were seen as disease carriers, we were often mass, well, we were mass detained, not often, we were mass detained for weeks and had to go through lengthy interrogations because we were suspect and thorough medical checks. If we were found to be unhealthy, we were deported back. And so 5% of the Chinese who took that three week journey, spent the entire family fortune just to get to California, never made it to San Francisco because of arbitrary health reasons like hookworm or roundworm. Again, the connection between policy and race occurred with the issue of tuberculosis. In the 1940s, Latinos and Asians were disproportionately affected and infected with tuberculosis because of environmental racism. We were segregated, had to live in more crowded conditions, were more likely to get sick in squalid conditions. Both sides of my family actually caught tuberculosis. And the policy back then was you would actually separate families and put the kids in the kids' ward and the adults in the adult ward. And so my aunt recalls, she was like two years old, they actually had to strap her to the bed and lock her in because it was required bed rest, right? So she was trapped. And she couldn't see her family for a long period of time. So you could see from this history because of race and because of health policy, my own family experienced exclusion, segregation, quarantine, detention, deportation, and long-term family separation. It's not because my family is more predisposed to get sick in those ways or to be unhealthy. It's because we are Chinese. And that's how the Yellow Peril has operated. <clears throat> Last year, um, when we saw the horrific murder of George Floyd, Asian Americans were stunned. We thought how, how, again, horrific that murder was, but there was also something complicating the situation for Asians, is that we saw a police officer, To Tao, actually it was, um, who was there complicit. He was holding back the crowds. And Asians seeing him realized that we looked like him and we couldn't distance ourselves and just blame him as, as an individual. We saw ourselves in him. That's the issue, that's the experience of people of color is that we can't distance ourselves from a co-ethnic. We see ourselves in him and we know that others see us in him as well. And so we had to worry and wonder as he held back crowds, are we complicit with white supremacy? Are we really in solidarity with Black Lives Matter? And so we were thrown into this identity crisis where we fit in in America's racial hierarchy. Are we white or black? At the same time, we realized, wait a minute, we are neither white nor black. And so a lot of times, a lot of us feel invisibilized. We feel omitted from racial discussions in the United States. We feel omitted from diversity forums. We feel neglected in racial history, in racial politics, were never surveyed, were not even considered underrepresented a lot of times. And so I think even in the workplace, Asians often feel unseen when they speak up at a meeting, they may be ignored, and then other people, would, their voices would get better acknowledged. So that feeling of invisibility, of being unheard, of being omitted is part really of the Asian American experience because we are neither white nor black. At the same time last year though, we also recognize Asians are racialized in a different way. We're racialized not whether we're white or black, but whether we're insiders to America, real Americans who belong 
or outsiders, perpetual foreigners. Sometimes we are considered Americans. We're the model minority used to prop up the idea that America is a meritocracy, that if you work hard enough, you could get ahead. We're white adjacent, we're honorary whites, we're crazy rich Asians. We're celebrated. But that belonging, that status is really conditional. It's really fungible. Because in times of war, such as World War II, when Japanese Americans got incarcerated, or after 9-11, when South Asians, Muslims, Arab Americans face Islamophobia, in times of economic downturn, such as when Vincent Childe, a Chinese person, was killed by white auto workers who mistook him for being Japanese and they blamed Japan for their economic downturn. And in times of pandemic, Asians are treated as perpetual foreigners, outsiders to be excluded. We're the yellow peril in those conditions. And you know, last year we had all three conditions. We had a US-China Cold War, we had the worst recession since the Great Depression, and we had the pandemic, right? So it's a perfect situation for us to be treated as outsiders, as foreigners. In half of our cases at Stop API, people say things like, go back to China, you effing chink, because they don't see us as belonging. This stereotype that we're forever foreigners, that we don't belong, is really much more operative, much more insidious, much more dangerous to Asians right now. They're not pushing grandma around because she's so smart. They're pushing grandma because they see her as not belonging to this country, they see her speaking a different language, they see her not belonging to a neighborhood. You know America treats foreigners really badly. We build walls against foreigners, we separate the families of foreigners, and so now Asians being perceived as foreigners is okay to spit on us. It's okay to push our grandparents. It's okay to mass shoot us. So Asians at this moment, again, are not accepted, do not belong to America. And in that way, I see us actually really partnering with Black Lives Matter. We're both groups stereotyped, mistreated, shaped by binaries of America racism that need to be dismantled. This insider-outsider binary can also help us understand the Atlanta shootings and how Asian American women are portrayed and um, represented, how they're treated and objectified. If you take an intersectional analysis, if you combine race and gender, you could see how Asian women are perceived. On the inside, women are portrayed as China dolls, docile, submissive, appropriate for the male gaze. On the outside, they're represented as dragon ladies, threatening, hypersexualized, to be excluded and feared. Either way, they're not fully human, right? These are stereotypes. And because we're stereotyped, because we're objectified, that's why I think the Atlanta shooter, he, he drove out of his way, even if he had a sex addiction, he drove out of his way to target Asian businesses. And he disproportionately shot Asian women, perhaps because of his sexual addiction, but perhaps because of the way women are racialized. So here's another case, I don't know, I don't know if you can read this and speak up if you can. Louder, please. Uh, customer began screaming at me for no reason while in line and correctly distant, distant at six feet. I am mostly Chinese and my family has been in St. Louis Obispo since the 1860s. I am fourth generation in St. Louis Obispo, but I guess I will never be an American. So that's the feeling we have as perpetual foreigners. I'm sixth, fifth or sixth generation. I don't think I'll ever be treated as a real American. So the impacts of racism have been collective, they've been violent, they've been deadly, but they've had other severe impacts as well. Asian Americans are among those with the highest rates of mental health distress um, during the pandemic, and those who experience racism have higher rates of anxiety, depression, and um, somatic symptoms. So here's a chilling fact. When asked, what's your greatest stressor during the pandemic? 
Asian Americans have stopped, who reported to stop API hate, those who experience racism, they ask again, what's your greatest fear? They overwhelmingly said racism. So think about that. More than a disease, a contagious disease that's killed 700,000 people, Asians are more afraid of other Americans and their hate. We're more afraid of other Americans than this deadly disease. That's how widespread the racism is. That's how fearful we are for our elders. That's how traumatizing it is. You could put on a mask to protect yourself against COVID-19, but you can't vaccinate yourself from some random stranger coming and spitting on you or shoving your elder. And that's why we're in such a high state of anxiety. That's why our elders are self-isolating and don't even go out. Um, Yi, can you read this? I was shopping and a child grabbed my arm. The child said I should go back to my country. That was the reason his father died. Mother came up and put her hand on my arm, but she didn't try to help me. Bakersfield occasionally has ignorant people who make fun of how I often look and tell me to go home. But this is the scariest and saddest experience I've had in the U.S. since about 19 Thanks. So here you can see how racism gets passed down to the child. But for Asians, we're saddened. We're, we're in periods of depression. We're scared. We have heightened fear. That's our mental health at the moment. Because of racism, we've been impacted economically. People thought they could catch the disease at our businesses, and so people were avoiding Asian businesses, Chinese restaurants, Vietnamese nail salons early on. Those businesses had to close even before quarantine shutdowns, and large portions of our community have been laid off. We have the second highest rate of unemployment after blacks currently. And you can see 83% of Asians with just a high school degree have had to file for unemployment in California. That's twice as much as those with comparable educations. Those of us in ethnic economies are more impacted by racism. It's just straight up economic distress caused by racism. And as I said, history repeats itself. We face racist violence and we would face racist policies. And so last year, the administration, um, because we're seen as the yellow peril, the administration banned Chinese scientists and researchers. That, this is the second Chinese Exclusion Act. He then suspended migration visas so families couldn't reunite. He cut refugee resettlement. The administration cut H-1B visas. All those policies disproportionately impacted Asians and again, treated us as the yellow peril outside threats to the nation's national security or public health. That type of policy continues today with the China Initiative. Oops. This policy, in its name, is a racial profiling initiative to target Chinese. And if you're a Chinese scientist or researcher, you're more surveilled, you're seen as suspect, as being a, a national security threat, threat, stealing secrets, or it's, trade secrets from America. It's been really chilling. So the first part in building the movement is that we as Asian Americans have recognized, wow, we're experiencing this racism and it's not just isolated individuals who are prejudiced, but it's structural. We're seeing that racism institutionalized. Asian Americans realize it's a political rhetoric that's fomenting. It's our government leaders are clearly fomenting the racism. And we're realizing it's not just us as individuals, but a lot of us as a group are experiencing it. And so for you who are here at this diversity forum, we want you to have that solidarity, to feel what we're feeling, to realize, even if I'm not Asian, I know what's happening to my fellow humans, and I'm going to care, and I'm going to take action. And if we do have that sense of power that we should take action, that's how movements start. We need to first gain that awareness and then have our minds liberated to want to take action. 
and the Asian American community has taken action. And so I'll quickly go through how we've mobilized. You know, I talked about how um, history repeats itself. Diseases come, Asians blamed, Asians face violence, Asians face racist policies. In all those cases in history, history repeats itself one more way. Asians have always resisted. We're not hapless victims to discrimination, but we've always fought back. During the Chinese Exclusion Act, the over 100,000 Chinese engaged in civil disobedience and refused government orders to register. After Japanese American incarceration, the community won redress and reparations. After 9-11, the community has won political office to fight for racial justice. And we're fighting again today, building a movement, and here are the ways that we are building the movement. First of all, we know our history, and so we're building on our history, not repeating our racist history, but learning about how we could be anti-racist. And so I come from San Francisco State, where we had the Third World Liberation Front strike. Students back in 1968 went on strike for six months to fight for ethnic studies. They worked in Third World, for Third World Liberation in solidarity with the Black Student Union. And so I've learned, and you know, those student strikers are still faculty at San Francisco State, so we've learned from their experience. We've learned from what happened after 9-11 with the South Asian Americans leading together. And so we've learned from activists from Vincent Chin, we've learned from South Asian, from Muslim and Arab American communities about how to respond to the racism currently. And we've learned from Black Lives Matter how to build a movement, how to react, how to communicate, how to um, fight for justice. So we're building on the movement. We're not, we're not reinventing the wheel, we're basically riding the cart that has been built for us. And the thing we've done is that we've really mobilized the organizational ties of the Asian American community. Um, Stop API Hate is made up of three groups. We have over 150 years of civil rights experience. And so because we've been in the community so long, we have leadership, we have networks, we have administrators, but we also have the trust of the community. We've been working with groups like the Asian American Leaders Table. And again, we've been able to mobilize our community, not one by one, but by mobilizing the networks that already exist. And that's why it's really important for the University of Wisconsin to support organizations like the APETA Student Center, right? It's in those organizations that students gather and when things happen, they could quickly mobilize, they could quickly respond. They develop leadership capacity in these student centers. And so that's why I really encourage you to support the PETA, the Latinx student centers, and others. And we were able to document. So we knew that government officials, media really pay attention to numbers. And that's why we created our reporting site. And that's why we've issued 19 reports in the last year and a half. Just cranking out the numbers to provide the context of what's happening. That documentation, our data, plus the graphic video footage, that's been used to actually spur the movement, right? Because people see it happening, it they feel it, but then they have the broader context of the numbers. So I hear you're doing a university-wide um, campus climate survey. Fill out that survey because it's really important for the university to know what's happening. Disaggregate the data so that we know how international students feel, how underrepresented students feel. Maybe first-gen students, Asians make up more first-gen students, maybe they feel more isolated. So that type of data is really, really critical. And that's why I really applaud um, a lot of the community-based research here at this university. So we're learning from the past, we're using our, our organizations, using the data, and then we've really been able to communicate well and to use social media like Black Lives Matter. Um, we had a youth campaign and because of social media, within a week, we gathered 100 students nationwide to devote their summers to stopping API hate. I don't even know where these students came from, right? You just put out something on the internet and bam, you got 100 students. These students then surveyed 1,000 of their own peers, right? Again, this is community-based participatory research and they wrote their own policy report. This policy report became the basis of Congresswoman Grace Ming's legislation to increase ethnic studies funding. 
High school students did that. High school students advocated so much that in California, the superintendent of schools wrote a letter to every school district so that teachers and staff know about the concerns of Asian American students about racial bullying. High schooler students got a statewide um, directive sent out. Likewise, other Asian Americans, because we're often invisible in media, we use alternative media. We use our social media to get the word about what's happening. And because that, our own messages went viral, then mainstream media finally paid attention to us. Then government finally paid attention to us. And so our influences really did make a difference. Um, in a movement, you need people on the outside really agitating, but you often need people on the inside of administrations working to make change as well. So like um, Dr. Charleston, like those here, really support them as they make changes from the inside as others agitate from the outside. It was only because we have Asian American legislators that we were able to make change. It was only because we have Asian American journalists that our story actually got printed or broadcast. So I talked about how most Americans are getting triggered by um, the sight of Asians are going to flight or fight response. In the same way, Asian Americans now are also being threatened and going into fight or flight response. We're being threatened by racism. And so our fight response is Asians are arming themselves. They're giving their kids mace. They're calling for more policing. The flight response is that we're the racial group least likely to send our kids back to the classroom for fear of bullying on the way to school or in the classroom. I don't know any Asian family that haven't told their elders to stay inside. So that's the flight response. Both responses repeat the cycle of violence, right? Because we're fighting back or we're fleeing and, not, and trying to ignore the situation. And so the racism will continue. But there's a third response to threat that I think is really adaptive. And I wish, you should write this down. I really love this. Beyond fight or flight to threat, we're flocking. And after Atlanta, after Indianapolis, we flock together to grieve and provide solace to one another in vigils. We're flocking back to Chinatowns in rallies to find strength and support with one another and with our allies. We're flocking back to ethnic enclaves to support our depressed businesses. We're flocking to chaperone our elders. We're flocking with you today, and thank you for flocking with us. Because that's where we find strength. That's how we find power. That's how we actually fly. And because we flock together, we have been able to make change as a movement. Um, as mentioned, the Senate passed a hate crimes legislation 94 to 1, which is remarkable in this period of polarized politics. President Biden has issued several executive orders. And in California, we actually passed a $156 million API equity budget bill. Not only does it recognize that Asian Americans are experiencing current racism, but that historic inequities still impact us today in education, mental health, and health. This is a model for the rest of the nation. Wisconsin should also pass an equity budget bill. And so I'm really glad to report that because we've been able to flock, because we've taken these steps, we've been able to make this change. So to conclude, you know, um, I was just walking this morning, I saw there was a Bascom Hall, right? And then there's a gigantic banner that says, Ford has no finish line. You guys know about that banner? Okay. Ford has no finish line. You know, huh, that really made me think. It's true, we want to keep on pushing forward. But unless you have a finish line in sight, you may not go in the right way, right? We're building a mass movement, but if our movement isn't directed towards what we want to go to, then we could get lost, we could go regress. And that's why I encourage us as we conclude, let's move forward, but towards that eighth fire that was spoken about this morning. Let's go towards the theme of this forum 
about rising up, rising above and reshaping the world in the image of justice. So the final part about building a mass movement is that you use organizations, you develop leadership, you change people's consciousness, but ultimately we want to change the narrative of America. Currently the America is that it should be a white Christian nation, so Asians who are neither white nor not often Christian are excluded. And I think actually this this feeling of being unaccepted, this foreignness, Asian Americans should actually reclaim that and actually use it as a strength. That maybe being an immigrant and being a foreigner helps us reimagine America the way it should be. We should remain foreign to America in a lot of ways. I don't want to belong or participate in a nation that mass incarcerates, mass detains, mass spits on Asians, mass shoots Asians. I don't want to belong. But being a foreigner gives you that vantage point to see what's broken about America and dream about what America should be and what kind of place we want to belong to, what kind of University of Wisconsin we want to belong to. So as we come out of the pandemic, this is a great time to change the narrative and reimagine our nation and our community. I don't want to go back to normal, but I want to imagine a place that doesn't have that white, black hierarchy. But we do recognize whiteness and blackness and celebrate it for the equal opportunities that we have. I don't want to belong to that America with an insider-outsider binary, but imagine a place where we all are welcomed, where we're all included, where our, our gifts are all celebrated. I want to belong to America where even if you are a foreigner or you're an international student, you're treated with dignity and respect. I want to imagine America that's actually more Asian so that elders are respected, so that we're more concerned about the collective public health and our own personal rights to wear masks. I want to flock with you and dream of a better America that I would want to belong to, where my kids could belong to. So thank you for dreaming with me today. Um, 10 minutes, about 10 minutes for question. Dr. Reese Ngani is taking some questions from uh, the chat and they will uh, coordinate that from, from there. And we, you have some cards on your tables along with some pencils, so if you um, would like to also write a question, we have some runners you can go around and collect them, but please hold them up high so that they can see them. In the meanwhile, we'll start with a question. Thank you so much, Dr. Jean, for that very inspiring and informative talk. You've discussed the lessons of building activism in the pandemic by not forgetting earlier activist moments and by using a flocking approach. Given the challenges of working together during the pandemic, how has Stop AAPI Hate as a movement created alliances with other communities of color? Is restorative justice an important element in that process? And if so, why? Yeah, so the question is, how have we at Stop AAPI Hate learned and worked with other communities of color? And for me, that solidarity has been critical. Actually, you know, this issue of anti-Asian violence it's not an Asian American issue. It's other people's issue with us. We're not the ones who are being racist. Other people have the problem, so other people have to take responsibility and accountability to make the change, right? So it's actually up to non-Asians to talk to their family and friends not to make offensive posts. It's up to other non-Asian family and friends to be upstanders and to stop racism when they see it, whether online or in person. So we've really been working because we need to educate other communities about who we are and why we deserve to belong. And I think, um, again, early on, sadly, we had a strategy session with South Asians. And again, East Asians are the ones being targeted mostly. But um, 
Stop AP Ahit is actually led by a South Asian woman, Manju Kokarni, and the Asian American Leadership Table is led by another South Asian, R.T. Kohli. And they had a great strategy session. Now we had to plan for worst case scenarios about this upcoming surge in racism. And so we actually planned for mass racial profiling. We actually planned for a mass shooting, sadly. And so when it came, we, we weren't prepared really, but we were at least cognizant that these possibilities exist and we were able to mobilize more quickly. So again, we've really learned from former activists from the past. We've learned from, again, Black Lives Matter about how to act with integrity, how to act democratically. And uh, we're going to continue to do so because, again, that solidarity is what we need at the moment, especially in this polarized nation. Thank you. We've had some questions about individual action versus collective action. One person asked, how do we change this? This breaks my heart, but I never know where to start to make a mass change. I can only change myself. And another writes about the fear of loss of citizenship or being stripped of naturalization for uh, individuals who are of Asian descent, referring to the same fears that the Asian American community had, the South Asian American community had after 9-11. So, if there are real fears in the Asian American community about what will happen to them if they speak up, or for allies who don't know how to help, what, what advice do you have? All right, so the question, there were two questions. Um, the, the latter one was, um, how do we overcome our fears? Because we could actually lose naturalization. We can actually be targeted. Again, the China Initiative is a Department of Justice. You could just Google it now. They have a website about the China Initiative and the FBI is surveilling Chinese Americans. And so innocent people are losing their civil rights and getting arrested, losing their jobs, um, losing tenure at university places because we are getting profiled. So that actually, that fear, that threat is a real one. And I think, again, for me, as an, um, I have to flock. That's the only way, I and mean, if we, experience this individually, yeah, we could lose our civil liberties. Yeah, we could be triggered and attacked, but we need to stay together to share and be open about it. And then the, the first question is about digital activism versus um, in-person activism. And you know, because of the pandemic, we had to organize digitally, and I think they work hand in hand. And that's how um, social movements operate now. We have to use social media. We have to use those networks. And so that way we can mobilize really quickly. We can get information out really, really quickly. But I think, again, um, for that sense of power, for that sense of efficacy, I, I really, I'm old school. I like flocking in person, standing up and protesting and demonstrating, because that's where you feel the power of each other. So for me, it's, it's both and to mobilize both on the internet and in real life. Thank you. We've had a question about collective racial trauma and its impacts. What strategies do you think we need to start healing from this trauma? And I believe the we in that refers to Asian Americans. Oh, okay, so that's a great question. If we're experiencing collective racial trauma. What would healing look like? And actually, what time of time? I could go on for, I, I'm gonna preach. Huh? I plan time, okay. I actually wrote that question because I wanted to preach. <clears throat> hurt people hurt people. Yeah. Abuse people abuse others. Those who experience racism are going to learn to be racist. Asians are going to be anti-white, we're going to be anti-black, or we're going to internalize that racism and hate ourselves. We're going to self-stigmatize. That's all happening. Do you have advice specific to the environment for empowering AAPIs um, in terms of someone who comes from a college with a small AAPI population but wants to know how do we specifically direct attention to empowering that group of people? Oh, wait. Um, repeat. I'm still not done with my last question, but... <laughs> okay. okay. We, we received a question from someone who's at a different college with a small AAPI population where flocking is a challenge. So how, what other advice could you suggest for empowering AAPI students? and staff and faculty. Okay, so that question was about um, how do we work with uh, minority groups or smaller populations of Asians. And I want to go back to that earlier question, how do we deal with the racial trauma? And I'll weave in how um, smaller groups can do it as well. So 
again, hurt people hurt people, and that cycle of violence is continuing, right? As Asians experience racism, we're just going to be just as racist as everyone else. And unless we actually take stock of what's happening, we're going to continue and the oppressed become oppressors, the exploited become exploiters, right? And I thought a lot, because I'm experiencing the trauma too, and I'm having signs of trauma and angry outbursts of anger that I have no idea where they're coming from, and I'm realizing, oh, I do know where they're coming from. I've had generations of racial trauma, and I'm, exact, I'm acting exactly how my father acts. I grew up saying, I never want to be like my dad in certain ways, and I'm just like him in my angry outbursts of anger. That's racial trauma. It's not directed towards white people, but it's directed on my own family. That's trauma. And so what's healing look like? And I want to stop it so my kid doesn't repeat that cycle to his own family, right? And I want it to stop so that this whole cycle stops for our entire society. And how do we do that? That's the big question. Not should we teach race, but how do we stop racism and its cycles of violence? And if we fight back, we're perpetuating that violence. If we flee, we're putting our head in the ground. So what we need to do is flock and collectively heal each other. It's not about self-care, it's collective care that we need. And we need to acknowledge the trauma we have to actively deal with it, we have to name it, and then we have to work together to heal each other. My wife is a um, um, development pediatrician and she does in trauma-informed care. She realized that the best way to build up resilience for those um, facing trauma is a presence of caring adults. So we need to be caring adults to each other, flocking at this moment as we all experience racism. Everybody has been impacted by racism. If you're a perpetrator, you've been impacted by racism because you're racist. You have no empathy. So we all need to learn to develop that empathy. And my hope is as I deal with it and as you deal with it in this diversity form, hurt people hurt others, but healed people heal others. And that's our great opportunity now. As Asians experience racial trauma, Let's get healed, and then what a great opportunity for us to be the racial healers of America that's been torn apart by the stealing of indigenous lands, that's been stealing black bodies and their labor for centuries. That's one of our opportunities, is if we could be healed, if we could actually show what it's like to be different, then maybe we could reach that eighth fire. And for Asian American groups, again, a lot of us are invisibilized, a lot of us are omitted. And we've actually looked at, we're disaggregating the data to see what's happening to Southeast Asians, what's happening to Pacific Islanders, and they too experience hate at even higher rates, and they experience hate in different forms. Maybe not COVID-19 racism, but maybe it's racial profiling by the police. Maybe it's mass deportation. So we at Stop API Hate are going to continue to work and to address all forms of hate, both institutionalized and interpersonal. Dr. Zhang, we have to wrap it up, but one last question, which is more of a personal question. How do you see your scholarship and activism intersecting, and what are your next steps for 2022? How do I see my scholarship and activism? And intersecting. And what? Intersecting. Like, how, why, is, why are they important to each other? Um, you know, in ethnic studies, it, was, it started from a student strike, and the aim for ethnic studies wasn't necessarily to help individual students learn. It's not for individual student learning and mobility to get out of the ghetto. Ethnic studies was actually for the community, for students to see themselves as part of community and to affect change in that community. So it's not this neoliberal university where we help individuals get ahead. It's a public university seeking the collective good of how can we make change in our society. And so that's how I see myself as a scholar activist. My role isn't necessarily just to, in, to educate individuals, but to see what's happening in the community, to respond to it, and to help students work together to make that community change.
Okay, thank you.